Welcome to Go on the Run. This is part two of our mini series for implementing a resource pool in Go. In this video, we're gonna be looking at how to implement our server. In the previous video, part one, we look at how to implement the client. So let's get started. So here I am in my terminal and I'm already in our part two directory and I have two terminal open. They're basically split is the same window, but it's split. And that's because I'm going to be running our client that we implemented in part one and today the server. So what does the server look like? Let's start where we left off in part one. So if I open up part one and I copy our last example, and I paste that for part two. Now when we open part two, we'll see we have a number of examples already. That's because I wanna save us some time on the coding. But we can see that the last thing that was pasted there was example seven. Do not worry about how fast I type because all of the code is available in GitHub. So as you watch this video, you can literally just open this link and go to the code and look at it. So don't worry about being left out. It doesn't matter if I type something and then erase it and you didn't get to see because what you're interested in is the end result. And that is what I have in GitHub. And because I've broken them up into so many examples and exercises, I literally changed about two or three lines per example. So you really should not worry about how fast I type. So this is where we left off. So here I call it seven, but let me just rename it to example zero to sort of say this is where we left off and what we want to do is if you remember we had a client we had a model to represent the data we can send between the client and the server so our goal for part two is to create a server so what does our server need to do well it needs to respond to client requests so let's implement a server very quickly to see what is it that we sort of going to be doing and then I'll remove that and then we'll go through the code slowly. We start with main.go and of course we need a main function. All right, there we go, main function. Doesn't do anything, but we want a server. Let's start off by asking ourselves, what are the things you might wanna do with a server? So you wanna start a server and stop a server. So that's one of the flexibility you might want to have and you might wanna create an interface for it because you might want to have different type of server, maybe a TCP IP server, maybe some other server that goes over some other type of transport mechanism, maybe one that is secure and one that's not secure. So let's create an interface to represent our server, which is a server that we can start and we can stop. So we have an interface defined for our server. Now let's implement a server. So what we want to imagine is that we'll have some type, let's say with the first server we want to implement is a TCP server. And for now our server is pretty simple. We just have a port, that is a member of this server. And if we want to be able to create a TCP IP server, start it and stop it, we might think that we might want to use it like this. So that's what we imagine using our server. We can start it, sleep for a little bit or wait a little bit, and then just stop our server. All right, so here's the problem. Of course, we're getting some error because this value that we have for TCP server from this type does not implement the start method and the stop method. And those are the methods we intend to be able to call from this server interface. So it seems like all we have to do is implement this interface. All right, one function to down and another to go. Now, how are we certain that we are implementing this server interface? Well, we can say that though, and we can have something like this. And now we can be sure, and we're getting an error saying that, oh, we cannot assign it because we have a method that is missing. And so we can easily fix that. All right, so this is not very exciting right now if we run our code, big deal, we'll see starting server, 10 seconds will pass, then we'll see stop and server. So this only implement our interface, but it doesn't implement a TCP IP server, something that actually, or HTTP server rather, so maybe we should change this name to like HTTP server, but for now we'll leave this TCP, IP, TCP server and let's continue by implementing an HTTP server. 
Now, with Go, it's fairly easy to implement the HTTP server. And so we can import the net HTTP package, and then we can call listen and serve. And if you look at this method, it says it takes the address on which to listen and a method to handle our request. And so usually the way you'd see this call is like this. And the reason why you pass nil is because you might register a number of handler. Now, if you look at that second parameter, it's a handler, HTTP handler. We'll get back to that later. But for now, we can pass nil because if we pass nil, there's a default implementation for that handler. We can add handlers to that default mux and we can get um, it to serve our request. And so if you look at this, you can see we can call handle function, pass a string, and we can call it, pass a HTTP handler, which by the way is the exact same thing we could pass to listen and serve. Or we can simply do handle func, which takes a string and a function that implements, that satisfies this interface. So we will go that route first. And so we'll say anything that satisfies slash root path, path or below, we'll just call this handler func. And we'll cut this part out. And we'll say our handle function is just called handler. So our handle function, so let's put it below here like this, and we give it the name handler. And of course, it's a function. It doesn't have any return value. So there we go. And our error message went away. And of course, we can print out something in our handler to make sure that oh, we are getting caught. Let's run our code and see if this actually works. And we're in the server directory. So we can do go build. And then we say server. And so our server is running. And then we can try connecting to it. And so we can see that we have connection or server is still running and we can send any number of requests or connect how many times you want to our server. So that works. So that's one easy way and one of the easiest way to write a server. Now we can do slightly better. Like as I hinted before, it's possible that you can just register a handle or also by implementing HTTP handler. And the way you do that is by saying, let's say we have a type called, I don't know, H handler, for example, and that's it. You just implement this serve HTTP function for your handler. How do I know that's what it require? If I go to, go along the command key on my computer, for example, and I go to the source code for this, for example, and I then navigate to what this is, you'll see it's an interface that has a function called serve HTTP that looks like this. So that is exactly what I have here. Now I don't have variable names attached to my parameters. So all I have is a parameter type and that's okay. If I want to access the actual parameter, then of course I could introduce a variable like write and read for example, but I don't really need them right now for this example I'm showing you. Of course, the reason why we're having an error here is because we need to pass a value. And so we can do that by simply saying that we have saying that oh, we have a new handler and we can pass that and let's satisfy our request. And so again, we can go build start our server and we can see that our server is running. So now that we know our server is running, let's stop that. And we can use this here instead. We can pass the same exact handler here. And then we don't actually need to register our handler. So this also works. So let's, uh, let's change our message this time, just to be sure that we're getting a message. So hello from our server mux. And let's just go build. And let's start our server again. And this time we do curl, of course. And then as you can see, it is still working. So right now, this is all pretty boring to you, you're thinking. 
So why am I doing this? Well, I want to show you the flexibility we have in implementing our server and the path we're going to take. This is all fine for implementing a server very quickly, but we might want more control. And the reason why you might want more control over the server you HTTP server you create is because you want to make sure that how you can control how long clients take to respond. If a client does not respond soon enough, then you can disconnect that client. And to have that sort of control, what you need to do is create your own HTTP server. And that's not what we're doing here. The way we create our own HTTP server is we do this. And now we can configure it. And we can set connection idle timeout, read timeout. So we can say basically, how long should we wait for clients to read? So this is a duration value. So we can say 10 seconds or whatever. It all depends on whatever makes sense for you. And so there are a number of things you can configure on your server, your HTTP server. And now that you have an HTTP server that you can configure, well, of course, you can also, you must set the handler. So we can say as that handler and it uses that same interface we had before, except now we don't need to call HTTP that listen and serve, but rather we call on this server object that we've created and configure with our address, our timeout and so on and the handler that we're going to use. And the result is going to be exact same as what we had before. So let's build and run again. We've seen several ways of building HTTP server, and this last way gave us the most flexibility. Now, since we're implementing the serve HTTP method on a type, we already have a type that we call our server. So you might as well just implement that method on our type. So we don't need a separate type. We already have a type already, so we can get rid of this. And then when it comes to creating and starting our server, well, we can take all of this and put it inside of our start function. And if you look at the listen and serve method, it returns an error. So seems like might as well just return from listen and serve. Now we're still sort of missing something. So what we need is a handler that implements a serve HTTP. Well, that just happens to be our TCP server. And so we can assign that here. When it comes to stopping our server, well, we can save the server within the TCP server itself. And so we can do something like And so there we go. We have now come full circle. But the reason why I want to show you this is to say that this is basically what we're going to be implementing. And I wanted to show you how simple this piece of code is without some of the extra fluff that we're going to put in there. We have server interface defining two methods, start and stop. Those two methods are here. Start a server, stop a server. We have a TCP server type, which is a struct that has some fields. We use this type to implement the interface for our server. And we ensure that that's what we did by having a variable for that interface. And then we create a value for our TCP server and assign it to this variable. Now, how do we implement the start? Well, we just create a new HTTP server value configure it and then save it in our server and start it. And we assume that when we're ready to stop it, we can just simply call stop on that server and it would close all the connection. For our serve HTTP method, which will be called by any client that connects to our server, we simply print out a hello message. But we know that what we want to do is to be able to consume messages that are defined by this model. I'll get rid of all this code because this was just sort of a heads up sort of thing. So we get rid of that. Now let's start looking at it. So what I have here is similar to what I created before, except I have this function called new TCP server that takes the port we want to listen on. 
and it starts the server. Right now, I'm not worried about stopping the server. In terms of the implementation of the interface, we just as before, we started to we had a server interface for TCP server that go. Well, we just have this new function that returns a server, which means it returns a value that satisfies that server interface that we talk about. So it does exactly that. It has a type called TCP server, which we saw before. This is going to keep a track of the number of requests that we have processed, the port, and we have a logger. So this logger is just from this package. So very simple so far. And all the reason why I have the logger inside of the struct, and that's so each server can have its own log level, and you can expose a method for the user to configure the log level for that server. So now that we have our type, we can start, we can configure it and return it. Now, we haven't configured the HTTP server itself. We still have to create that. Here, we have the start method that we've implemented for our type. And it doesn't actually start anything. It just logs a message saying that it started. And of course, we want to test and make sure that we're not being called with nil. And so that's what this takes care of. When it comes to stopping a server, well, if we don't have a valid object we return but if we do well we just stop it so this is what our first stab at a server look like and you can imagine that oh this is going to do exactly what it says just prints out a message that is starting and nothing interesting so i am not going to run it so if we go on to exercise two however and we look at main nothing changed nothing changed in our server. And what we have done in the TCP server that go itself is we have added a variable. So now that we have a pointer to our HTTP server, we can create an HTTP server. We can configure it with timeouts. And like I said, as the server, the reason why we want to do it this way is because that allows us to say that if a client connects and we try to write to them, and they don't respond within 500 milliseconds, we are going to close that connection. If a client connects and we can't read from them in one second for some reason, we are going to close the connection. You should definitely be creating your server this way so that you can define the timeouts because as the server, since it's long lived, you do not want errant clients to connect and not do anything and just use up server resources. Okay. So in terms of our port, we just say listen on all addresses for that port. And then I configure our server handler, which is going to be this object itself. And then we save that HTTP pointer and we return that to the user. The user can then use this now to call start. Now, how do I know that all this is going to work? Well, here we have implemented that HTTP serve method as before but it doesn't do anything. We have our close method, which is gonna call close on the server. And you can see that though when it's called on the server, well, it closes all HTTP connection. And here we start listening for connection. So at this point, we should have a valid HTTP server. So let's run it and see what happened against our client. So there's our server listening. And so, we can do, and so there we go. And so this is how fast it's processing those message. And while this message is a debug message, we had to set our log level for debug messages. Now, when we're tired of seeing debug messages, we can set our log level higher so that we don't see debug messages, but we'll get to that later. Our client stops sending messages, but our server is still listening. Let's kill this server. Pretty straightforward. Example three, still working on the server. Nothing changed in main. Nothing changed in the server that go. And so if we look at this to see what changed, we just simply did some work on how to decode our messages. So before we were simply just printing out this message, but now we want to say they want a new JSON decoder and we want to initialize it with an IO reader. So if 
you look at the documentation for the HTTP um, request, you can see that uh, there's a body property that we can use to read data from the client. It's actually a read closer. So we need to start initialize our decoder to read from it. And we defer close in this body when this function exit or returns. And this is important. You want to clean up resources. So again, you should definitely read the documentation on how you should handle um, this body. And so once we have a JSON decoder, we can now say that our, the message we want to decode is a client request. And we can ask the JSON decoder to decode that message. Once we decode it, we'll pretend that we're doing some work on it by sleeping for five milliseconds. And then after that, our function will return, which will clean up the body and of course release this up. So let's run this code and see what happens. Exercise three server. There we go. And we didn't change our client so we can rerun the same client, but we should expect the same result because we're not really doing anything with the messages and we still log in. The only difference now is that we're actually decoding the messages. So let's stop our client. And to prove that we're actually decoding that message, let's do this. Let's take out this debug message. And before we go to sleep, kill our server and rebuild it. And so this shows that oh, we are decoding the message from the client. And as you can see, this is the request ID. Okay, so that works. So, okay, so let's move on. So the only lines we've added are as this line to randomize the time that we sleep. And we've initialized our random number generator this way. And of course the import for our random number generator. But other than that, nothing else has really changed. We put back in our debug message and we took out the one that was printing out the ID. So we just restore our code. And of course this is going to work, but we're not gonna run it because all we saw before it was working. Okay, so let's move on to five. And again, if we look at what is changed, we'll see it's very little. We've now introduced the idea that we want to sleep for 10 seconds after starting our server. And we're gonna print out this message that says, this is how long we're gonna to go to sleep for. And then we're going to do the sleep and then try to stop the server after we sleep. Then if we go to our implementation, we can see that we've added this message that says when we call stop and we close all connection to the server, then we should print out how many requests we have served. Now, if we are going to be printing out how many requests we have served, we should be keeping a tally of that. And the way we do that is by using the atomic package, which come from sync atomic and provides us this function called add un64 and that allows us to increment this value in a way that is safe if you're running it from multiple go routines and so this is one of the easiest way there are two other ways i can think of but this is the most straightforward way one way is to use a mutex and lock acquire a lock before you increment this value but since we will be locking and unlocking for every request and a request coming in very frequently I think that's going to actually slow down our application. The other thing you can do is decouple incrementing this value from the code that needs to send you a tally. And that is by running a Go routine that's solely responsible for incrementing this. And so now you have one piece of code that's incrementing this value. Each time a request comes in, just simply send a message over a channel to that Go routine. So that's another way of doing it. And so you don't have to actually do locking and unlocking. But since we have the atomic package, why not use it? So now we're incrementing or each time we get a message and we're printing out that number at the end of our server. Besides that, we don't need to actually do anything else other than import sync atomic. So let's see if this works. Remember, we've added in main the ability to wait 10 seconds and then shut down everything. So let's go to that exercise five and hmm. This is interesting. It says our server is listening, but we don't see that message that says server started 
and I'll go sleep for 10 seconds. So this means that we never return from this call to start the server. And so it doesn't really matter that now we're trying to wait for 10 seconds and then shut down. This will run forever and be blockier until we actually stop the server. So let's fix that. So this is not working. Exercise six, it's not very different than what we had before. We're checking for a return value from our start function because it says it's return a value. And if there's a problem starting our server, well, we'll print that out and return because there's nothing else to do if our server is not running. But if we can start our server, then we'll wait for 30 seconds and we'll print out that we're sleeping and then we'll shut down our um, server. Now, while we're sleeping, our server is running a separate thread, so that's okay. It's still going to be server request. So let's go to exercise six now. Server build it let's run it and so there we go sleeping for 30 seconds okay how did we implement this this time is it because we have a return value no remember before this call did not return so we had to do something different and what we had to do was this when we call listen and serve it does not return right away listen and serve always return a non-nil error this is what it says here after the server shuts down or close, the return error is error server close. So we're simply waiting for the server to close. And so we never return this value. So what we need to do is create a go routine to say, go listen and serve. And then we'll give it some time to start up. Now, whether it's 200 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, five seconds, I don't know. I just pick a value. But essentially what I'm doing is saying, I'm giving you 200 milliseconds to be able to listen on whatever port I've configured. And if you can't finish or if you can't successfully start off a server in that time, well, then I'll assume that oh, the error value that is stored here is from our server and I'll return that. If not, I will be returning nil because remember, this is still be in this go routine running. Now, how does this go routine exit? We have to figure out how does it go routine exit. And so what we can do is the go routine exit once the server is told to shut down. Remember that if it says that here, if the server is closed, then it would return. And at that point, it returns a value. Of course, we don't care about the value at that time because our function has already returned. We don't care. And so the way we get it, our go routine here to exit is by calling close. When we call close on that server, this will return an error at that point. So if you notice here, now our server is working correctly. We start the server, we wait it for 30 seconds, and you can see from here, the time is 30 seconds. We started at 11.32.41, and 30 seconds later, well, 11.33.11, 11, we were able to see that oh, we were stopping our server. And since we didn't process any messages, well, we see zero. Well, there's an error. So let's go fix that. So process message messages processed. All right. So let's fix that. Let's rebuild our server. Let's rerun it. And now we can run our client. And so our client is connecting to our server. We don't see all those messages because we went back and we changed the log level from debug to info. So now we don't see all those debug messages. We don't want to see those. We only see information level messages and above. So errors, warning, info, that sort of thing. And so this is an info message. And let's wait and see. Our client is still running. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take our client, but you can see our server terminated after 30 seconds. At that point, we had sent 9,700 messages. And then our client complained. And we can see that the client tried to send to the server and it says connection refuse. Makes sense because the server was no longer listening. So that is fine. So now we have a server that can listen for a period of time and it shuts down. We see how many messages. Well, what is the goal of this anyway? Now we have a client, we have a server. Oh, great. Remember, the goal is to see how much work our garbage collector is doing. And the way we can see that is by profiling it. Not profiling in the way you use the Go Profiler. 
but by using something else that the Go Runtime offers us. So if we go to the Golang documentation, Packages Runtime, and we scroll down a bit, you'll see that oh, there's this variable called the Go Debug variable that controls debugging variable within the runtime. And we can simply turn on a number of things. Now it's a comma separated list of name equal value pairs. And so you can look through this list and see some of the things you can turn on. The one I'm interested in is this guy, go G GC trace and it says setting GC trace equals to one causes the garbage collector to emit a single line to standard error at each collection. So this is what we want. We want to see each time there's a collection that basically we want to have an idea of how frequently we call in the garbage collector. Because if we can run our code without a resource pool and have an idea of how often we call in a garbage collector, then put a resource pool in and see that we call in it fewer times, then we can say, hey, it's a good idea to use this resource pool. But remember, before we make changes, we should measure so we can compare it to see if we're getting any benefit. So let's do that now. And so there we go. And this is one easy way I can run, set this variable and run the server. So essentially what I'm doing here in Unix is saying, I want this variable to be defined with this value when I invoke this command and create a process. Another way you can do it if you're in a Linux type system is you can also say export and that sets it for the lifetime of the session. Again, in Windows, remember that how you have to Go to Windows and set your environmental variables in control panel and so on. But at the end of the day, you want that variable to be divine, go debug. And then now when you run your server, and then now I go back and run my client. And as you can see, it prints out, let's open this a little bit. You can see this is each time the garbage collector had to be called to release memory. And so for the 30 seconds that our server is going to run and notice how this number is increasing. This is always going to be increasing because this is the each occurrence of the garbage collector running. So this number is going to increase. It tells you the garbage collector run 24 times so far. So for this program, it ran 25 times during the 30 seconds. And you could see that here. This is how long the program was running. And we know how we set it to run about 30 seconds. And we could look at how long it took and how much memory it freed up and so on. All we're really interested in is how frequently it was called. And in that 30 second, it was called 25 times. So our goal then is going to be, can we keep our application running for longer than 30? Remember, in this example, we're stopping it after 30 seconds. But in a real application, your server will be running a much longer time and therefore all non-on resources. So we will see if we can keep our server running have many clients connect and disconnect over a period of time and see how often they call the garbage collector so that's going to be in the very next video if you have any suggestion for improvement or anything i could have done better please let me know um, remember that all the code is available in github take care see you in the next video